morning. Please take your seats. And you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. So you're going to get there, and then we're going to pray. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter is written by Peter. It was written to a bunch of Christians in churches that were located in a region east of Rome. They were scattered throughout that region. And written to a bunch of Christians that had started to undergo some persecution, but in a couple years were going to face some very, very severe persecution. Uh, arguably the most severe persecution that occurred in the first century. So anyhow, we're going to be in First Peter. Let's pray. Father, I come in Jesus' name. I, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. You are great. And Lord, so many, so many times we just forget to express that to you and forget to really uh, express to you how grateful we are. So many times probably, Lord, what we do is we come across... Uh, just with with ingratitude and i pray that you forgive us for that because lord you're good you really you owe us nothing and you've given us everything lord uh god your grace has apprehended our lives has turned us around changed us put us on a, a collision course with heaven so to speak and we have everything to be grateful for forgive us when we're discontented forgive us when we fail to express it help us to be a more thankful people and lord even as we we tackle your word today we are thankful for your word i mean you've given us your word you speak to us lord through your word and by your spirit i pray god that your spirit rest upon me today i pray that your anointing rest upon me i pray for everybody in in our auditorium today god that you you would just touch their hearts right now lord there's a lot of things that are, are pulling for different ones attention lord thoughts that are going here thoughts that are going there i pray god that you would help pull that together right now and everybody in here lord would get their minds just kind of prepared rested settled to be able to hear from you and lord that your word would go forth and jesus that it would impact our hearts and there would be truth that would wedge in our hearts. It would be a truth that would set us free, and it would be a truth where need be would convict us. It would be a truth whereby as we receive it and we become, Lord, just not hearers but doers, that we become more closely conformed to your image, that we become better people and stronger people and more like you as a result in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, last week, last week our lead text was from Luke 646 where Jesus is speaking and he says why do you call me Lord Lord and you don't do the things that I say so I talked about obedience last week and how how, how necessary obedience is to the Christian life obedience shows that we love God obedience reveals that we know God obedience is an evidence that our salvation and our faith is truly genuine obedience is something that actually strengthens us so when the storms of life and we all face storms and tests in life that when they come our way we end up getting through them we end up standing through them we ended up we end up not crashing and burning this week now this week I want to talk about holiness talk about obedience last week and holiness this week it seems to me I could be wrong but I don't think that I am it seems to me that the uh, current Christian community, the followers of Christ, have kind of taken a step back from talking much about obedience and certainly from talking about holiness. It's not surprising because in the current church climate, um, you know, kind of cultural relevance is everything. Cultural relevance is the beginning, it's the middle, and the end. And when you, when you bring up holiness, you say, well, how is that... You know, how is that relevant? It doesn't seem to be appealing. It doesn't seem to have an attraction. It doesn't seem to be interesting. It doesn't seem to be compelling. And especially not to that uh, all-important people group called the millennials. I mean, every, every church and every meeting I go to seems like that the millennials get brought up. We've got to figure out some way to be relevant to them. And then the younger people and, you know, it just does See, to talk about holiness gospel-driven holiness, or to talk about what God said, be holy as I am holy, it, it doesn't seem to have the same pull that uh, how to have your best life now. Or, I'm picking on somebody, right? Or, or, or seven steps to victory over anything and everything. I mean, those titles, boy, it doesn't matter what age you are. Boy, let's, let's listen to this. But 
But holiness, doesn't that sound a little bit outdated and old-fashioned and not relevant? And I actually, you know, for me, I get a little tired about hearing relevance. Because I'll tell you, it's relevant if it's God's Word. And holiness is relevant. And holiness is relevant to every person. Holiness is relevant and crucial to the Christian life. Holiness is a central topic of the Bible. God's holy, and he said he expects you to be holy also. So it's crucial, and it's relevant, and it's critical to God's call and God's design for you and for me. And in fact, in the New Testament, Scripture says that without it, you won't see God. That's Hebrews 12, 14. Without holiness, no one will see God. In Leviticus, God said, you're to be holy as I am holy. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul's writing to that church, and he says, this is God's will for you, your holiness. Some will say this is God's will, your sanctification. Sanctification and holiness are synonymous there. And in our text we're going to read today, Peter, writing under the inspiration of the Spirit, says this, as he who called you is holy, you're also to be holy in all your conduct, or you're to be holy in everything you do, or you're to possess a comprehensive holiness in all your thoughts, all your words, and all you're doing. You're to be holy because, or since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So, you know, holiness, and talk about holiness, is in fact critical. It's central in the Bible. It's crucial. And because it is the Bible, it's relevant. So we're going to look here in First Peter, and we're going to start, first of all, just parking here for a minute on verse 1. This says, Peter, an apostle of Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, he's the writer. It says, to those who are elect or those who are chosen, some translation, the Greek word electos means chosen, elect, to those who are chosen exiles. And you'll see he uses the word exile, he uses the word stranger throughout First Peter to describe Christians. And what, what he's communicating there, and he wants the Christians that are recipients of this letter to know, is say, look, their home is not this world. In fact, with the coming persecution, some of them might be gone from this world. So he uses that. You're just passing through. You're just a sojourner here. So he says, this is to the chosen exiles of the dispersion in, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia. These are the different areas. Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, real quickly... I mean, the text, talk, talk about being able to pack a lot of stuff into one verse or two verses. It's simply phenomenal. It says, uh, the, the Father chooses, the Son purchases, and the Spirit sanctifies. You got the sprinkled blood of Jesus. And boy, take some encouragement here today. The blood of Jesus is sufficient for any and all sins. There's nobody sitting here that has committed some sin that is too much for God. There's no sin that's been committed that's too much for the, for, for Jesus, that his blood cannot atone for. So whatever, whatever you've done, whatever it is, whatever you're feeling guilty of, confess it to the Lord. None of it is too great for the blood of Jesus. And if you continue to carry it, what you're saying is, God, you're wrong. Christ's blood is not sufficient. And I don't think anybody wants to be in that position. So wherever you're at today, you got something you've been carrying? You got some sin? You're dealing with something? Confess it to the Lord because his blood is sufficient. Then it says sanctified by the Spirit. Now I want to talk about this for a minute so you get some definitions down. Nobody really, I don't think people are in love with definitions, but I'm going to give you some definitions or else you're going to get off track here. To, to be sanctified, to be sanctified is to be holy. There are two different ways that the New Testament, or two different aspects of sanctification in the New Testament. The first, if you're taking notes, is definitive sanctification. That means that the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are separated unto him, for him, dedicated to him. Your sins are forgiven. You've been made righteous. That's called definitive sanctification. That's why when the Apostle Paul writes to the Christians at Corinth, he can say to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. could be this way. To those who have been made holy in Christ Jesus. That's definitive. And then most of the New Testament, when it talks about sanctification, talks about progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification. See, you've been sanctified. That's a, I'm, 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 I'm a holy child of God now. Progressive sanctification is God working by the Spirit, by the Word, in every different uh, way that He has to work so that you begin to behave, to live, to think more consistently with who He has determined that you now are. You follow that? You're a child of God. 
you're in Christ, you're sanctified, you're holy, but if you're like me, if you're like me, it's hard to live holy, isn't it? Some of you, it's not. But uh, it, it, it's, it's not easy. So the rest of verses 3 through 9 then go through. And what, it, what, what verses 3 through 9 do is he's just communicating so you have a better understanding of salvation, of blessing, and even goes so far as to say to these Christians that are already undergoing some suffering and are going to go undergo some more, is to even say, look, even the suffering is not bad because it's going to produce something in you. It's going to be a purifying effect on your faith. And I think bottom line what he's after there relative to suffering is this. is say your salvation and your blessing is so great in Christ that this suffering cannot even compare to it because it's so great. And then he gets to verse 13, which is where we're getting at today. Really, 13, 14, 15, 16, we're going to probably say there. He says, therefore... Therefore, what he's doing then is he's referring to everything that's gone before. What he's referring to is he's saying, therefore, in light of, in view of the great salvation you have, in view of the fact that the Father chose you, the Son purchased you, the, the Spirit sanctified you, in view of the fact that you have these blessings that are, he says you have blessings, you have an inheritance laid up for, in heaven for you. And not only that, to be guarded by a faith, he's saying, I'm keeping an eye on it. This is going to be sustained. This is yours. This is for you. You're a child of God. You're even going to go through some suffering, but you don't have to worry because it's going to purify your faith. You know what? People in the Old Testament, even angels, they look forward. They want to just see this, de th th this time and this day. And here, therefore, this is, what's, this is your saving grace. This is the grace that saves. Or if you take a note, you can put it this way. This is past grace. This is grace that's already been realized. This is the foundation of, of everything that we do, and it propels us into the future. Properly called saving grace, properly called past grace. It's grace that's already been experienced. So, therefore, in light of all that, he tells us this. Prepare your minds for action. This is... Uh, this actually has what's called imperative force. It's, it's an imperative, but it's leading to something. It says, prepare your minds for action. In, in other words, uh, uh, if I put it this way, begin to align your thoughts with God's thoughts. Get prepared to do what God wants. See, in the uh, contemporary times when Peter was writing, they had uh, long clothing, attire, and in order to run, they would pull it up. Or actually, when they were in battle, they pull it up and they tuck it in their belt so they could be free, so that they could move. All he's saying here is saying, look, get, get your minds ready. Get your thoughts ready. Get yourself positioned to move in accord with God's will. And then he says, be sober-minded. That's another command. That's another one. Uh, it's a participle with imperative force. It's driving something. Be sober-minded or be self-controlled. Be even-minded. Be free. Actually, it's a it's actually a bit of a warning against being distracted. How many of you know, especially in this world, it's easy to be distracted. I think in the ancient world, it was less easy because you only had a few things. To, you know, you had to concern yourself with like food, shelter, and defending yourself. I mean, you kind of boiled life down to some very basics. But today, we got so much and so many things pulling for our attention. So this text here is more relevant than, 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 than ever. So he says this, gird up, a, gird up your mind. And be sober-minded. Prepare your minds. The King James says, gird it up. Sober-minded. And then he gets to the point of this particular clause, because this is the main point. These two things are leading to it. The main point, and this is a command also. You know what's interesting about the New Testament? You don't always see it. I mean, sometimes you read it, and you'll see, oh, well, it says command here and a command there and command. But I, I read through passages like this. You know, you can get through like three verses, and you'll say, boy, he just sent forth like six commands. You know, there, there's, a, there's a sense sometimes that the New Testament doesn't ca carry commands. That's just nonsense. Jesus is Lord, and he's the one that gives directives, and the Spirit inspires the text, and he gives this command. So we got another command, and here's the command. This is where this clause was getting to. It's that you set your hope fully. Set your hope fully. Not a little bit, not halfway, not almost all the way, but set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is properly called future grace. Do you know there's future grace? Sometimes we just kind of view grace as sort of monolithic, and we don't think too hard about it, and we don't have categories for it. But actually, the Bible gives us categories 
for grace. And this is future grace. This is the grace that's to be revealed when Christ returns. This is the grace that's to be revealed when we see Christ face to face at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this is not, he doesn't say set your hope, you know, he doesn't say set your hope fully on, um, you know, getting your new car, your new house, or your new job, which may all be expressions of grace. They may all be part of what God does graciously. But he says, this is what you set your heart fully on, the, the hope, right? The, the hope, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set your hope fully on the hope, or, or set your hope fully on the grace to be revealed at the coming of Christ. I mean, that's where it's at. Set your hope fully on that grace. This is a grace to come. It's a future grace, and that's where it's at. So, and then he goes in verse 14, I think pretty powerfully, says you set your hope fully on that grace that's to be revealed. And I will say this. There's past grace and future grace. Past grace, we tend to get a motivation because of gratitude. And then there's the active working of grace in our life. Future grace is when we look forward to it. And I'll tell you, future grace, actually future grace will help you to live right. Because you look forward to that time when Christ returns. And he says, enter into my rest, good and faithful servant. And when there are rewards for faithful obedience and that kind of a thing. So anyhow, he set your hope fully. And then verse 14, as uh, the scripture, almost every translation I read translates it as obedient children. As obedient children. Those who set their hope fully on the grace to be revealed are obedient children. And obedient children is actually is a good translation. But when you do read this... In, in a Greek text, it, it actually, rather than saying um, obedient children, it actually says children of obedience. And it's a little bit different. There is a little different, a little slice of difference in the meaning there. I'm not sure. I assume the translators translate it this way because it just flows better and nobody's going to split hairs too much on it. But there is a difference between obedient children and children of obedience. Uh, uh, obedient children puts the emphasis on your conduct. It does. That's what it is, obedient children. But children of obedience puts the emphasis on character, who you are. That's who you are. You're, you're a, a child of obedience. One commentator, I think, got it very, very well. He explained it this way regarding children of obedience because he would have, I mean, I looked at the text and I said, well, yeah, that, that's what it is, children of obedience. But, you know, guys that translate these things, they got more education than me and they know better, but I can still read. You know, I can, I can see what it is. So I'm looking at a commentator, and he argues very persuasively that it should be children of obedience, at least understood that way. And he said it's a Hebraic way, in other words, a Hebrew way of portraying something and a way of describing a person whose character is obedience. Now, you've got to understand that. That means that's who you are. And see, what you do comes out of who you are. That, that's the difference between being and doing. Being always has to proceed doing, because if you get into doing and you're not being, you'll see when you get into doing it, you're going to just burn out and you're not going to be able to do it. It's going to become frustrating, and the Christian faith is just not going to be for you. So anyhow, so those that have set their hope fully on the grace that's to be brought to you in Christ Jesus are obedient uh, children or children of obedience, and as children of, obe of obedience, they're not conformed. See, it says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. That also, it can be read, do not, as a prohibition, and that's a good way to read it. It can also be read, and I think this is the way the Spirit inspired it both ways. Don't do that. Don't be conformed to those old ways of thinking and your old de desires. But it also can be read, stop being conformed. In other words, look, all you Christians out there, uh, I know where your default position is. I know that, you know, as you grow in the Lord, your default position becomes more and more Christ-like. But I'll tell you, you're always falling back to what? The way you were in the flesh, the way you were outside of Christ, the desires that you formerly had. And he says this, you know, if you set your hope fully on, on that grace to be revealed, and as children of obedience, boy, don't be conformed to the way you used to think. Romans put it, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he gets to the second part, which is really more of uh, the heart I want to get to. He says, but as he who called you is holy, and this is a command too, boy, right here, you also be holy in all your conduct. Can, can also, you can read it too, you also become holy in all your conduct. Not, not much difference, but... Be holy in all your conduct or be holy in all you do. This is actually a call for comprehensive overhaul in your life. It's talking about the way you think, the way you talk, what you do. All of it 
Everything you do, you're to be holy. And then it connects verse 16, and it says, Since or because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You shall, and there's a little bit, it's not quite cause and effect, but there's a kind of a, what would be called an inferential relationship between 15 and 16. He's saying this, you're to, be, you're to be holy in all you do. And the reason is, is because God said, I'm holy, so you're supposed to be holy. But here's what you have to see. God's holy, so you're supposed to be holy. Holy, first of all, is a status, a state of being before it is a doing. If you don't get, I'm holy, and we'll see this. If you don't get, that's who I am, I'm, I'm, the Bible says we're saints. If you don't get that, then you're never going to get the doing because what you're going to do is you're going to become a rule keeper and you're going to have little things, check boxes that you check off, and you're going to deceive yourself into thinking you're okay or you're going to frustrate, frustrate yourself because you can't do it. But let's talk a little bit about God and God's holiness because there, there's, there's aspects to the holiness of God, and some of the aspects of the holiness of God, guess what? You're not supposed to be like. See, God is, God is what's called holy other. He transcends everything. He is above and beyond everything everything. He doesn't have any peer. There is no one that matches up with him. There's no one that compares with him. He has no parallel. He is majestic. He's above all things. He's all of these things. In fact, I was just reading uh, when we were worshiping. I kind of looked at it real quick. I wasn't sure the passage, but uh, it's in Isaiah, and God actually says at one point, I think it's Isaiah 46, he, he, he says, uh, he's kind of comparing himself. He says, what other God can compare to me? In other words, even when I look around, all these things that purport to be gods, they don't compare to me. There's nothing that compares to me as the inference there. And then in another section of Scripture, in Psalm 50, it's kind of a funny Scripture, but not so funny. He's talking about people that have misjudged God. And he says, you, you thought that I was like you. Wow, could you imagine that? You just have a, you thought I was like you. Guess what? You got it wrong. It actually was in the context of God kind of pointing some things out and judging some things. To say that God's holy is to say that he is beyond us. He's bigger than us, stronger than us, more pure than us, more knowing than us. He, there's no one that compares to God, and there isn't any way to draw any kind of a human analogy. And when you look at Scripture, anyone that came in contact and got a glimpse of the holy God, I, I, as far as I know, in every occasion, was somehow humbled, crushed, falls apart, repents, does something. Which concerns me, that doesn't concern me, it concerns me when some refer to God as uh, Jesus' old man, Christ's old man, as somebody did. But are you serious? Or someone I was listening to the other day talking about Jesus, and he's making believe he's talking to Jesus, and he says, hey, bro, I don't know why you're doing... That's an overly familiar way of relating to God in almost a dangerous way, in a way that trivializes who he really is. See, he's a father, so we love him, Abba Father, and, 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 and all those kinds of things. But, you know, if you've got a good father, you don't become overly familiar with that father and treat him like he's just your bud, you know. He's got to come along. You don't do that. What happens when you meet with God is holy. And the fact that he saved you in Christ Jesus doesn't make him any less holy. It doesn't mean you can, you can come boldly to the throne of grace. Well, guess what? You're still coming to the throne. So, anyhow, that's God's holiness. And there's a secondary connotation to holiness. It's a very strong one, and it indicates moral purity. And that's a good, and it's important. Moral purity, uh, moral living, etc. But moral purity, even as important as it is, is not what's most basic when we talk about you're to be holy as God is holy. Because what's most basic about holiness in the Scripture, biblical holiness, is this idea of being separated unto. It actually, if you read in the Bible, and I, I know you have, but I mean, you can, you can go through it. Holiness has to do with a separation or death. It has to do with where you stand in relationship to God. Like if you, or even with, for things in the Old Testament, when somebody would dedicate something to the Lord, and it was considered as 
holy unto the Lord. What is that saying about that thing? It's saying that that thing stands in a distinct relationship to God that it didn't formally stand. To say somebody is holy is to say that they stand in a distinct relationship to God that they didn't formally stand in. That means that they've been kind of moved from out here to in here. Holiness fundamentally has to do, first of all, before we talk about moral purity, as important as that is, before you talk about doing, you first got to get down to a being. What is holiness? It means that you stand, this is who you are. This is your identity. This is who you belong to. You stand in a distinct relationship to God. You're dedicated to God. It's based on a relationship with God. It's a unique relationship that God has established. It's a unique relationship that God wants with his people. Does it have moral implications? Yeah, it certainly does. I mean, don't mistake me. It certainly has moral implications. But the call is, first of all, to be holy before you do holy. Because if you try to do holy without being holy, you're not going to be able to do it. Or you're going to become a Pharisee. Um, and you know, you know, see, that's the thing. And that's where you just check off, you know, you check off the boxes. And I'll tell you, it's scary for me because I've said to you before, I, I'm a really good rule keeper. And I, I actually think that if it's a matter, if, it, if holiness was a matter of checking off boxes, you give me the boxes that need to be checked off. I'm talking about dealing with the inside. I think I can check them off or get them checked off most of the time. And then you know what happens? It gives you the appearance of being holy when you, in fact, are not. And it gives you a, a false sense of security. And, you know, I, I'll tell you what, there, there, there's whole denominations and just Christian upbringing and things like that that reduce Christianity to keeping certain rules. You know, I, I, I'll bring up Kyle again. See Kyle back there? He's a good Christian man, loves Jesus. He's justified by faith and faith alone and all that kind of stuff, not, not as a result of works and all that. But you know what? He was at the picnic yesterday, and he, he was playing cards. It was Uno, but it was still cards. Now, some of you might come, and he comes from a, he come from a real strong kind of Pentecostal sort of holiness bent there. And I'll tell you what, any of you that know anything about that, and it doesn't have to be Pentecostal. It can just be, you know, it can be, it can be any kind of Christian thing. You know what? I'll tell you what. Cards, even the mere sight of cards, <laughs> you were in trouble. I mean, if the pastor was coming to visit you, the first thing you did is put a Bible out so he thought you were reading it. The second thing is, is you made sure there were no cards anywhere in the house. And, of course, certainly no alcohol. And God forbid cigarettes. And, and a bathing suit might even be worse. Oh, don't you got to remember, man. You get this, this day and age, you just. <laughs> man. You can't reduce it that way. See, holiness, holiness as a matter of first order has to do with being separated unto God, having a relationship with God. And then what, call, what, what holiness calls for, to, provides. You know, those who place faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we're forgiven of our sins, we're made righteous, we're assured of heaven and eternal life. All those things are true, and we rejoice over them. I just kind of mentioned them a little while ago or alluded to them a little while ago. But what's underappreciated is when we place faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit brings us into union with Christ. It's an unappreciated doctrine. brings us into union with Christ. We're now united with Christ. So when Paul says this, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. This is a live man. Uh, he said, I have been crucified with Christ, yet nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Here's what happens, and you can read it in John 14 and 15. You can read it other places of Scripture. Romans chapter 6. When you trust Christ, you become united with Christ. Christ comes to live in you, and you come to live in Christ. You now have what's called an in Christ status. That's why Paul can say, those who are sa sanctified, he doesn't leave it there, those that are sanctified in Christ. Those who are holy in in Christ. You're not holy apart from Christ, and your behavior doesn't make you holy. You are holy because you're in Christ, and Christ is in you, and when you're united with Christ, you share in, 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 in Christ, and his holiness now has become yours through faith. You share in that, not God's transcendent holiness. I think there needs to be a distinction made in that. 
we're, we're never going to be, look, when you get to, contrary to what some people do say, when you get to heaven, God's still going to be God and you're still going to be people. It doesn't matter what you do and where you go and how strong your faith is. You're still always going to be people. You're never going to be God. And you're going to share in some of the things, as that's Christ-likeness uh, made in the image. You're going to share in some things, but there's a whole lot of things you're never going to share in. And that's okay, because God's God, and he'll remain God. And he doesn't make you into gods. That's the Mormon doctrine. That's not the Christian doctrine. It's not what the Bible teaches. So... When you place your faith in Jesus, you're united. Christ in us, you in them. And, and what, what he does is through faith, all the things that you can't do and all the things that you are not, he makes you. Uh, so God's calling for way more than adherence to a set of do's and don'ts. He's calling for you to be rightly related to Christ. I mean, this is just simply the gospel. The reason I entitled this Gospel-Driven Holiness and the reason I present the gospel just about every single week is, is because that's at the heart of it. That's what starts you. That's what keeps you. That's what finishes you. See, the thing is, is you're not going to be holy on your own. You're not going to be holy by checking off a, a box. You know what? Does God want us to engage in holy behavior? He sure does. But the only way you're going to engage in holy behavior is if you have been made holy, if Christ lives in you, if the Holy One is in you, and you share in what is in is. Yeah, if you clap, that'll make me think it's relevant. <laughs> Not that I, uh, I have to do that. You know, I, I, I conclude a long time ago, you know, I go to a lot of meetings, you go to conferences, you go to all these things, and, you know, after a while, I mean, this is just me. It's like, you know, I'm so tired of hearing about relevance. You know what? <laughs> you, you know, it, it, it's relevant or else it's not God's word because all of God's word is relevant. Now, we can present it sometimes in irrelevant ways, but God's word is, is relevant. So to be holy is a relationship. To do holy is an expression of that relationship. When he says you've got to be holy in everything you do and all your thinking and all you're saying, and then he goes to the next thing and he says you shall be holy as for, for I am holy, I have no, no question in my mind. What he wants us to see is this. Get your relationship right with God in Christ Jesus and now be holy in everything you do. Because then what it does is it's an expression of it. Look, when you come to Jesus, if you come to Jesus and you surrender your life with, to Jesus, if you fill yourself with Jesus, if you love Jesus, is, if, if your hope rests upon the revelation of the grace of God to come when Jesus comes, if your present hope as you're moving through life rests on what Christ has done, if Jesus lives in you by his spirit, if you've done that, then you know what bleeds out of your life? What pleases God? What, you know, the Bible says that the, uh, I guess Paul wrote it to Timothy. He said, you know, the law isn't really for righteous people. It's for unrighteous people. Why did he say that? He said, because if you've got Christ in your life and Christ fills your life, then the things that need to go will go, and the things that need to stay will stay, and the things that need to come will come. Now, don't misunderstand me, because I don't want any of you walking out of here and saying, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, I just need to believe in Jesus. I can do what I want. No, you can't. Uh, I mean, the Bible's full of, you know, kind of ethical lists and things like that. But the point I want to make and the point that the Bible makes and the point that uh, the Gospels stress, well, Paul, they all do. They, the entire New Testament stresses is you don't get saved that way and you don't get holy that way and you can't do any of those things that way or not many, many of those things. What you have to do is you've got to get right with God first. And when Christ is in your life and you're forgiven and he's made you holy and he's made you righteous, then that's an expression. So, you know what? Um, and let me, let me just say it again because I just, you know. Is there a holy and unholy behavior? Yes. Okay, you all get that? Yes. <laughs> Should we avoid the unholy? Yes. Should we pursue the holy? Yes. Should we do it out of a right relationship with God so we don't evaluate our holiness on how well we check the check by? Yes. All right, you got it. Good. Because I just don't want you leaving here thinking, well, yeah, that's it. Libert, what would it be? A libertine pastor, he just got freedom to do whatever. No, I don't. You know, you got freedom to obey Jesus. <laughs> so we're called to be holy. And I, I, the first question you got to ask yourself probably is, Man, am I living a holy life or an unholy life? Because you might come to the wrong conclusion that you're living a holy life. What you've got to ask yourself is, are you right with God? You know, have you trusted in Christ? Is Christ your Lord and Savior? You've got to ask yourself that question. And then if you're a, a Christian and you have in principle right standing with God, here's what I notice that happens. 
you know, just really quite frankly with Christians, is they get saved by grace, and then you're just trying to do. And they try to do all the right things. And I wonder sometimes, I mean, I, I don't altogether question the motivations, but sometimes I wonder if trying to do the right things is not so much to please God, but to feel better about ourselves. So we feel like, okay, I got this, I'm okay. Not sure. I think it might be mixed motivations for people. But if you're a Christian and you're asking yourself, you know, am I holy? Do I have a right relationship with God? Uh, and you come to the conclusion, you know what, I, I definitely believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord. I'm definitely a Christian. You might have to renew yourself, though, in that. I've said so many times to you guys in the church, man, preach the gospel to yourself every day. Because if you preach the gospel to yourself every day, you're never going to be doing this thing on your own. You're never going to be thinking you do it on your own. You're never going to be falling into this check-the-box-off Christianity. You're never going to be, I got my ethical list of do's and don'ts, and I'm getting right, so I'm okay. No, it's not going to be like that. You're going to have a relationship with God. We're called, so we're called to be holy. Ho that being holy precedes living holy. We're called to live holy. The holy life is not driven by adherence to a set of do's and don'ts, but is driven by the gospel. It's the good news of what Christ has done in Christ, who we are now in Christ. It's a gospel-driven ho holiness. You know, I had an opportunity just past week, somebody I've been witnessing to for a pretty long time, came to know Christ as Savior and Lord. And uh, I, I, it, it was just, it was phenomenal in so many respects. I mean, always, I mean, one of the greatest miracles and greatest joy is when you have an opportunity to see somebody come to Jesus. And uh, he was talking to me, young man, uh, a millennial. <sighs> I'm sorry, millennials, I'm just messing with you. It's just everywhere I go, every article I'm reading, it's, it's like millennial, 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 millennial. You know what, there's other people alive besides millennials. But I understand, okay, I want to be relevant. Um, he's, he, he meets up with me, and he says, um, he says, I want to accept Jesus. I'm like, wow, how cool. Now, see, a lot of you know me pretty well. So what I didn't do, and, you know, I understand, okay, what I would have done a long time ago, I was like, okay, go ahead, let's pray. I didn't do that. <laughs> what I did is I took a step back, and I said, okay, look, let's talk about this just a little bit more here. All right? And I just laid out the gospel for him again about sin, about salvation, about grace, about hell, about new life, about the fact that if you commit your life to Jesus, and I use surrender a lot, if you surrender your life to Jesus, there might be some people that are very close to you that aren't going to be happy with that. And I named some of the people that I knew that were close to him. So I, what, what I did... <laughs> What, what I did is three-quarters of the people that had listened to that, they would say, oh, I see, you know what, I don't think I want to do this. But no, what I was doing, and it was prompted by the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying I would always do that. I knew it was the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, I just sensed it was the Spirit of God. And I laid that out for him. And he said, no. He says, no matter what, you know, I want to give my life to Jesus. And then I did something else that I, you know, I lead people in sinners' prayers. I think, uh, you know, uh, prayers are good expressions of faith, and it helps uh, be a marker for people. I always tell them there's, you know, there's no magic prayer. The prayer doesn't save you. It's, it's believing in the heart. Um, so, but he says, well, what do I got to do? And I say, you know, I think it would be good. And we went over some other things later, you know, now that I'm saved, what do I do? But what do I do? I said, I think it would be good if you prayed. I said, prayer is a good expression of faith. If you really believe in Jesus, I said, you ought to pray and kind of tell him that. So then, rather than lead him, and I usually will lead somebody, rather than lead him, and this guy was a Catholic guy uh, with really not much church experience at all. He's never been to a church like ours other than uh, actually he attended uh, Aaron's funeral, heard the gospel there. And uh, I think other than that, I don't think he's ever been in a church, you know, a Christian church. I said, you know what I think you should do? I, th I think you should pray. I said, why don't you express your heart to God? I said, I'll just be alongside you. And he prayed the best prayer. He, 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 Jesus, forgive me for my sins. This, this is, here, I'm picking on millennials. This is a young millennial. Sin? You know, we're supposed to not use that term anymore. Sin? And I'd already gone over some things with him, what that means. Forgive me for my sins. And then he prayed, uh, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I was like, man, he could stop right there, but he prayed a few other things that I don't remember. They're the things that stand out for me. I I'll tell you, holiness, holiness is first and foremost possessing a unique relationship with God through Christ Jesus. If you're not saved, you need to commit your life to Jesus, surrender your life to Jesus. 
If you're saved, you got to get out of the trap of keep trying to be holy. Let me just check off another box. What you got to do is believe and trust Jesus. Put your faith in the promises of God. And again, you're, through the Word and through the Spirit, there's going to be things that just aren't part of your life anymore. Amen? All right, so you got it. Holiness is first a being, and then it's a doing. Amen. You know, we all, I, I think we all ought to just really, in your heart of hearts, you ought to rejoice over that. Because if it was a doing, we're all dead. No hope. Let's stand and pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness, your grace, your mercy. I thank you, Lord, that righteousness is a free gift. I thank you that... Uh, Lord, you've separated us. You've made us holy, that we are holy because we're in Christ. We're sanctified because we're in Christ. And now, Lord, we can live, live a sanctified life and a holy life. Certainly not perfectly, but we can do that now because you live in us, and it's an overflow of who we are. Our character is one of obedience. Our character is one of holiness. Our character is one of righteousness. Our character is a a Christ-likeness. So we begin to operate out of that Christ-likeness, that new identity. Help us not, as a church or individuals, to just simply be rule keepers, keeping score to see if we're doing okay, but rather we would be people of faith, setting our hope fully upon you, upon the grace to be revealed, rejoicing in the grace that we've already experienced, and living in the grace that's quite present. In Jesus' name, amen.